Hello! Today I'm taking a brief departure from games to take a quick look at the recently released and much anticipated Final Fantasy Ultimania Volume 2, which covers the origins, concept art and design notes from the 5th generation console games, so Final Fantasy 7 through to 9. Now, the Ultimanias have been floating around in the Japanese language for around two decades now, and the Final Fantasy 7 uh, Kaiti Shinso Complete, excuse the pronunciation, was uh, published back in 1997, and this was a precursor to the official Ultimania series, which officially started with the Final Fantasy VIII Ultimania in 1999. Since then, a number of enthusiasts have imported and otherwise translated portions of the Ultimanias, most significantly the contributions made at the Livestream.net, which are generally, you know, the site in general is a good source of Final Fantasy news, lore and contribution. And having been browsing these screen grabs of concept art and the translated design notes and the translated lore of these publications for a number of years, I've been keen to scratch beneath the surface of these games, as is probably obvious from my channel anyway, for those that frequently listen. And, you know, I've always wanted to find out a little more and discover a little more about what goes into making them. So, fast forward to today... Square have finally published archived volumes of the first 14 games in English, and being a product of the PS1 era, I opted to purchase Volume 2, which covers Final Fantasies 7, 8, and 9. And for those interested in the publication and its contents, uh, this is basically my two cents worth to describe what the book entails and what you can expect from it. Now, the first thing to discuss, I suppose, is that depending on what kind of fan you are and what you seek to discover about Final Fantasy, informs how much this book appeals to you or not. And as mentioned, my personal interest lies within the extended universe and the lore of these respective Final Fantasy worlds and games. And what I was hoping to glimpse from these books was an idea of how the narrative development, character and world creation, and the disparate elements of in-game mythology came about. For example, one of the things that the Livestream.net translations show with regards to Final Fantasy VIII is some background information about Great Hine, who is this unseen deity who creates the sorceresses. And, you know, a bit more meaningful explanation of Ultimisia's intentions, who obviously is quite an ambiguous final boss who is revealed, you know, towards the end of the game. It also has some quite intricate diagrams in these translations of how the planets Gaia and Terra in Final Fantasy IX coexist and, you know, interact and consume one another. And it develops the idea of Garland and the Terran's agenda too, and how they consume other planets. And this is really great kind of lore and explana uh, explanation for the, for the wider game events, and it's the sort of stuff that I love to discover and read about. So, turning to the archival volumes, it's prudent to mention that these are very much abridged versions of the original Ultimanias, and so some of this more extensive contextual detail is omitted. For example, the original Final Fantasy VIII Ultimania is 480 pages long. The original Final Fantasy VII publication is 336 pages long, and the Final Fantasy IX Ultimania is a whopping 591 pages long. By contrast, the entirety of Volume 2, which contains all three PS1 titles, as I've mentioned, is only 320 pages long. Now, this is partly to do with the dimensions of the respective publications, and the Japanese versions uh, were quite considerably smaller. However, it's also attributable to the lack of content being translated over to English which, again, depending on your interests, your favourite game, and what you'd hope to discover about Final Fantasy in these books, could be considered a disappointment. And, for my part, with the lore and the story of Final Fantasy VIII being among my favourites, the new Ultimania gives Final Fantasy VIII the smallest portion of the book, which is to say roughly 80 to 90 pages, compared to Final Fantasy VII and IX, which make up the majority of this Volume Two publication. So, with this said, there are some very small glimpses into the production and the creative processes, and a few pages of storyboards and production notes that pique the interest of those interested in the, you know, the more conceptual and developmental side. 
And the most prominent example of this, which I really liked, is in the story development notes for Final Fantasy VII, in which I think it's Yoshinori Katasi talks about a dual timeline between father and son, which sees the player go back and forth between playing within these two chronologies for Final Fantasy VII. Now, this is an interesting insight to the creative process at Square and the Final Fantasy development team, because where this idea was clearly scrapped for Final Fantasy VII, it became the foundation and the backbone uh, for the gameplay and scenario design of Final Fantasy VIII. You know, of course, with the the uh, Laguna flashback segments between Squall in the present and, and Laguna in the past. And I really liked being privy to how these early concepts emerge and percolate among creative teams. And referring back to the translations of the Japanese versions, this seems to be much more of a feature in these original Ultimanias, rather than the abridged books that we find uh, with these newly published archive volumes. So, on the one hand, this editing down of the content is understandable, because compressing three games into a single book, which in its final form, you know, as it stands, is quite substantial, does require some editing and some consideration as to what should be remain, uh, retained. But on the other hand, it also leaves this sense of being deprived from some excellent bits of uh, conceptual lore and narrative development that's unavailable anywhere else. And what they did choose to leave in is information and captions describing in-game events that we are already aware of having played the games, and character profiles that are available in the strategy guides and even in the original PlayStation 1 booklets. However, for the art lovers out there, and particularly fans of Yoshitaka Amano and Tetsuya Nomura, th this book is ideal, and it dedicates most pages to the character designs from their rough sketches through to the final polished renders. And this goes for some of the more significant enemies and summons too, such as Ramu and Odin and Tonberries, for example. But once again, the sense of creative development and progression is only partially realised here, because, for example, it's known among fans of the series that Cloud Strife was originally envisioned as having, you know, a slicked back uh, black hairstyle, for example, and the concept art shown in the in the Ultimania is basically just iterations of Cloud once he's already been established as this blonde, spiky-haired soldier. So, ultimately, it depends how far back you'd hope to dig in terms of the, the conceptual design and the lore of Final Fantasy. <laughs> and as someone who works in a creative industry, I can vouch for the fact that there are probably hundreds of pages of story notes, character designs and ideas sitting in a drawer somewhere in the Square Enix building that would have been ideal for a publication such as this. But all that we've eventually been furnished with is the final leg of the design development that largely found its way into the game anyway, so we're much more familiar with it uh, than any of the, you know, the first and second stages of design that they might have. Which... Again, depending on your interests, could either be a good or bad thing. Additional pages that also offer some great insight into the production of the games is storyboards. And we have storyboards of battle animations and FMV cutscenes, and there's some neat breakdowns, for example, of the Final Fantasy VIII opening sequence, and some really cool um, scamps of the Final Fantasy VII limit breaks that shows the consideration and the competence, in fact, of these storyboard and art designers. Um, at all stages of the development process. And we have some cool breakdowns and screen grabs of, you know, Cloud's cross slash and his blade beam attacks, for example, which are rendered in these medium fidelity sketches. And it's really quite interesting to see, particularly how faithfully they did seem to find their way into the final game. So, ultimately, and to conclude on this very brief look at the book, I described the Ultimania Archive Volume 2 as a great art book, or a coffee table book, and it's aesthetically substantial and beautiful to look at, and the contents hinge heavily around the conceptual artwork of Yoshitaka Amano and the designs of Tetsuya Nomura, which are beautiful to flick through and admire on this high-quality paper. But, frankly, if you're a fan of the series, it may not contain anything that you're unfamiliar with by searching online, and if you're looking for information on the lore, the backstories, and the creative development, 
it's not to be found in these particular publications, which are content to show the design process for the final stages of the game, rather than a peek underneath the hood at the creative collaborations and ideation of the guys at Square 